What's up, everybody? Thanks for listening to the last American Outlaw podcast. We appreciate you very much for listening, watching all of our YouTube videos, checking us out on Instagram, all that good stuff. We need your support. We appreciate your support. We actually, something that you may not know, is have a, have a, a Patreon. Check us out on Patreon. Patreon, some of the things we can't do, we, we talk about tactics, we talk about, you know, modifications to different things that the the YouTubers will not let us do. So we, we have that stuff in there, uh, different build part, like, you need to be on Patreon. If you're not, um, it's like the cost of one Starbucks per month to get some pretty awesome info. All right, so today t we want to talk about LPVOs versus red dots. It seems to be a very hot topic right now. We thought we'd do a podcast on it so you can listen to it while you're on the work or on the can, whatever it is that you're doing right now. And uh, so today I have Mike, Mike on the mic, who's going to help us out with the military side of it, how the military views it. And of course, he's not speaking for the military. So for all you freaking crybaby libtards out there, he's not speaking on behalf of the military. He's just giving his experience. <laughs> And I'm not speaking on behalf of law enforcement or self-defense in America. I'm just giving you my experience and my opinion. But here it is. So let's let's dig into the worms. LPVO versus Red Dot. But before we do that, Mike, I want to I want to jump into a little bit of history of them. All right. Okay. All right. So um, one of the things we were asking first, let's go let's go way back. Let's go to Vietnam when they just had open sites. Okay. All right, and then let's jump from there to uh, I, when did they get the first red dots? Oh, they got them in Vietnam, right? The M point two thousands, right? You, you, not really. No, they had those in the nineties yeah, for the, the first 90s. Iraqi war. Yeah, yeah. So in the first one, you started to see that's where you had the carry handle modifications because we didn't have flat tops, and we had you know you had the the optic up Black Hawk down, right? Yeah, that kind of stuff. So nineties, my, my old man didn't have any optics in his rifle in Vietnam. You know what I mean? Okay, so all right, yeah. Well, I shouldn't say that they had the Starlight like first generation night vision that was like apparently the size of a tank that they would put on. M14s. Okay. So I remember, I, so I do not know when they got aim points. I'm guessing it was the nineties, but I remember the, I just remember reading this and I wish I could find it. I can't ever find it, but basically however many rounds that people were shooting per person that was shot in war, it went down two thirds when they got a red dot. So I know the original red dot like aim point was designed to work with your tunnel vision. So it has the that that degree to give you your tunnel vision, and that's why they did it. It worked well with your tunnel vision. So if you're shooting like an aim point, you know, any aim point that is a tube, it works with your tunnel vision really well. And then most of the time, if you're under any kind of stress, you don't actually ever remember seeing this, the dot. Um, but that was the original reason that I remember that aim point came up with the, the scope ring because it was working with tunnel vision. Hmm. Um, and then, so, so Mike and I were talking about this. This is why I thought this would be a good conversation. So I said, I remember the first popular things we did was, um, the Mark 12, like Marcus Luttrell in Lone Survivor wrote in his book that he had a Mark 12 and that literally changed. I mean, the Mark 12 got to be the most popular gun there was. It still is a very popular gun. And, but optics have changed back then, but let's start there. Where, what was the reason for the optic, which I would argue is not an LPVO. That was not an LPVO. No, it's not. I mean, yeah. I mean, not in the way we would consider it now. It, it, it was kind of more of like a traditional hunting scope. So it wasn't a three by nine. It's more or less like a, a two to 10, right? Like, so we had night force two to tens, uh, you know, the 32, they don't make it anymore. It's a beautiful scope, but, uh, I have one. I was lucky enough to, to buy one from night force. So, I love that thing. Uh, you know, a two to ten gives you that special purpose rifle, which is what the the, the Mark Twelve was. The ability to the intent was to be able to reach to that six hundred yard, six hundred meter range with a five five six, which the, the cartridge will do, the bullet will do, especially with seventy seven grain ammo. Um, mm -hmm. And that was an attempt to start to put precision fire on targets that were you know peeking around corners or whatever in Iraq uh, during that time, but also Afghanistan. We need a little more reach. I mean, first. First pictures I ever had, I had a, a you know a senior chief that was one of the first guys uh, with SEAL teams in Afghanistan, and it's funny because it, they're all holding them 14s. 
like Woodstock them 14s. I'm like, oh, he's like, yeah, man, we need to shoot fire. Oh, cool, bro. All right. So that's kind of like where that SPR came from. But the optic on it is, you know, as we're talking about, is that is effectively, you see this a lot in military. Um, they're not always on the cutting edge of what the next conflict will turn out to be. So in, in the Vietnam era, we didn't have like sniper scopes, right? We went and Carl Sathar and those guys, they got Winchesters and then they put hunting rifle scopes on them. And that's what they were. That's kind of what that SPR was. It was, wait a minute, the civilians have a rifle. It's an AR-15 that shoots really well. And let's put a, a civilianized scope effectively on it. So it, it gives you the magnification of that 10 power to identify targets really well. Um, or way more so than anything else that you know you would have been issued or you had access to outside of a sniper rifle. And even then, a lot of the sniper scopes in that time frame were 12 powers or a 15. Uh, and that's kind of where it was. So there wasn't the 25s. I mean, the 25s were around. You know, the Schmitz were around. Those were the the ones that people would have. Uh, a Leopold Mark IV, like, yep. Um, that was a standard issue scope at the time for DMR rifles, especially in the army, uh, and, uh, and sniper rifles as well. So that two to 10 worked out really, really, really well. Um, I really love mine and it gives you the ability to, like you said, look farther downrange, identify targets, make more precision shots, but you still have that low two power where like a three to nine, the three is just a little too much where two, you can still, okay, I can see that. Yeah, and M2 is still just a little too much. Like if you're doing any kind of CQB or yeah, CQC, it's too much. It's too much. Which is really where we started to shoot offset. We started to turn the, side, the gun sideways, right? So if you had to shoot something, and that even came from um, just having scopes like that were that were high, not higher, but just higher magnification. Because some of the very first LVPOs we were starting to get um, – were a Trigicon product. It was a 1.25 to four power post AccuPoint scope, right? How we got them, I don't know. They were never a program of record. They were never, never like a supported thing, but God, we had a bunch of them and we put them on stuff and we had Schmidt one to fours and they weren't really true ones because even until recently, nobody's got to a true one. Um, and, I, and I mean, true one is like a one, not a 1.2 or a 1.5 because those don't look quite right. The, none of the true ones that are marketed out there are truly a one. They're like a 1.01 or something like that because you need a little tiny bit of that magnification. But, um, you know, so that that one and a quarter was still sometimes too low for a quick shot. So you would turn the gun sideways and almost just effectively look down the side of the barrel where the rail was. Or then we started mounting. I had a J point is what it was. And I mounted it up on the forward rail and it was pretty forward because you didn't want to back by the ejection port and you had, to, you didn't have a lot of upper rail space on your receiver. Um, but you put it up on your, on your, um, your handguard effectively a little bit more forward of the ejection port. So you didn't interfere with ejection at all. And uh, you would turn the gun sideways and that's how we shoot. Now it's like, Oh, integrating the mounts and whole nine yards. Now we're doing mounts that go on the side of the optic and this and that. And at the same time, we also had ACOGs. Uh, which were, as you don't, as you know, are not a LVPO because they're not variable at all. So military, we all had the four power. So just the standard four and the, you know, there's pros and cons with that standard Marine Corps optic. Uh, that was one of the only magnified optics that you would be, have access to if you weren't in one of those special purpose rifle style guns, or in our case, we had EBRs, enhanced battle rifles, uh, which were M14s that were cut down, shortened, uh, accurized sage, uh, sage chassis systems, whole nine yards. So they were kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that SPR, that, that, that two to 10, that's, that's kind of where I think people started thinking about what can we do with LVPOs along with the other commercial products that were really out there. And that drove the military requirements to say, okay, what do I need? Marine Corps has been killing and working and doing really well with this ACOG. We know what we want for durability. We kind of understand that four is good, but more is better. But we also know if we get more, uh, unlike some of the other, other ACOG products that are the sixes and things like that, machine gun optics, well, I still need one. And then they started putting the, the RMR, which is what it was designed for on top of the ACOG. We all put it on pistols, but, uh, that was to give you the close range stuff. Well, there's gotta be another solution civilian wise, you know, uh, a Trigicon or uh, another companies were doing it. We're doing these almost ones and we were all screaming, we need one. We don't need, and then we were doing a red dot. So for us, I had two uppers, um, you know, 
LVPO style upper and a red dot upper. I switched them around as I kind of needed. And then the red dot guys were like, oh, we're going to put a magnifier on there. And all right, cool. And we had that flip mount on the magnifier. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. But, you know, we never really got to, there's there's a lot of pros and cons. And I guess that's why there, this is such a hot topic. Yeah, it is. It is a hot topic. All right, guys, we're going to take a break right now and uh, stand by for the sponsors. All right, guys, this podcast is brought to you by Aeolus Defense, spelled A-E-O-L-U-S defense.com. Check us out at aeolusdefense.com for all of your armor and the NSO belt. Aeolus Defense partnered with the uh, Navy Special Operations and created a special gun belt for them to be able to do VBSS. And if you want what is on the cutting edge of technology, gun belts, go check out aeolusdefense.com. All right, guys, we're back with the Last American Outlaw podcast and Mike talking LPVOs. All right, Mike, so we just finished with the um, kind of where it started with the Mark 12 and the 2 to 10. And then what what was the first onset of when when did we get our one to fours because it wasn't one to six yet it was one to fours um if I, best of my recollection it, the the unit got it and army tier one got it and it was a schmidt and one to four i think larry vickers said but yeah it's a uh, short dot one to four we had them as well so it was so you guys got what everybody has to remember is at that time you know we were we did not have um to go back a little farther, right? We go to World War II. The uh, American industrial base goes to war with the country. In OIF, OEF, whatever you want to call last 20 years of conflict, the American industrial base has not gone to war. So it did not stop building washing machines and start cranking out M1 carbines. And it did not stop doing, building F, new F-250s right now and start pumping out M4s. FN started making M- more M4s. Cool. Colt kept making M4s. That was it, right? Like, so when we were first going into Iraq and Afghanistan, it was what we could get however we could get it. We literally had what was called cow money, cost of war money. And uh, we would go out and be like, dude, I don't know. This this looks like it's about right. Hence, an AccuPower 1.2 to 4 because we, there wasn't anything else. Now, Trigicon makes an actual 1 to 4 in the second iteration of that. And they were less expensive than the Schmitz because Schmitz have always been expensive, but uh, they're also amazing. So that was one of the first one to fours that I ever saw was a Schmitz. Uh, we didn't have sixes. The six was not a thing. Um, I don't even really remember when until later on with kind of like the Vortex. It was, it was that kind of generation where we saw a six power. It's like that Razor was the first six that anybody really kind of noticed. And obviously it's in use um, through some units and things like that. But we were looking at what does commercial have? And that it was a weird, weird relationship between what does the military want? What is civilians buying and what are they using? How are those two markets growing or changing? Um, Because the military complex on requirements and getting stuff done is long and hard and laborious. And if it goes on a weapon, it can be very difficult. Um, Because at the end of the day, the optic is very important to me and you as gun guys and as the guy has to carry it. But if I'm the Department of Defense and the major killer in Iraq is IEDs, do I care about giving my guy a better VCOG or an ACOG or whatever? Or do I care about building an MRAP? Uh, MRAP, that's cool. So one thing, one thing I want to bring up, we have a lot of new shooters and a lot of younger shooters that are coming into the community now. They don't really remember the cowboy days of Iraq and Mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Um, and, and I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about cow money or like, I always say, if I'm going to pick an optic, I want to pick what the military has proven over time. I don't necessarily want the next thing out to defend my life. I'll have it. I'll test it. I'll play with it. But when it comes to my life is on the line, I want what the military has tried, true, proven, and it's going to work. And this goes to show at that time, you know, you, you guys tried, true, proven it because you didn't know what there was. But the reason there wasn't a lot at that time, guys, that you don't know yet is, or you may not know, at that time, 
AR-15s, like when I first became, I, I first got into law enforcement in 1998 or 99. Civilians weren't allowed to have an AR-15. I remember we, oh, we had the, a, it was a Clinton ban. On, it was a Clinton it, yeah, ban. It was, it was impossible. That's right. And so, so from there until like 2004, 2005 is when that ban came off. When was that? Three, yeah, four, I was four, in college. Yeah, yeah. Three, four, five, somewhere right in there. Okay. There was nobody like Colt and Bushmaster made AR 15s. Nobody else did. Yeah. Uh, FN, I think. Oh, I don't uh, even remember FN making. I mean, yeah. it was literally uh, Bushmaster. I mean, that was the, I remember looking even before that, cause we had the gun store up there in Alaska. And I remember looking through the catalog and being like, Oh yeah, these are Bushmasters. And I remember looking through the Bushmaster catalog yeah. all and the time. And our those. argument was what's better, a Colt or a Bushmaster. Yeah, and then so I'd be like, well, I like or Bushmaster. Armalite. That was or Armalite. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And guys would be like, I can't even believe you'd consider a Bushmaster. You got to have a real Colt. And I mean, that was really an argument for guys back then. Right. And so I look at it now and I'm like, okay, look, what you don't understand is nobody was innovating the AR-15. Oh, no, yeah. Nobody was innovating LPVOs. I mean, when they issued me my first Bushmaster, it was a 16 inch with a carry handle and they gave me two 20 round magazines. Yeah. And there was no, no optics. Well, I mean, even look at what, uh, I mean, there's a debate between why we have an M4 versus M16s, but you know, the very, some of the very first pictures and, and, and everything going through as they invade Iraq, you can see um, this kind of hodgepodge, if you would, of what everybody has, because the other thing that we didn't have as a military was necessarily the, um, again, like I said, the industrial base behind us, we didn't have armor being produced, right? We didn't have MRAPs being produced. We didn't have all these other things. So we were grabbing what we could and that's why not everybody was the same. So the Marine Corps had been a pretty, been doing pretty good at this point. They had said, we want this Marine Corps, you know, opt, we want an ACOG. Right. And that, that was kind of what we, like when we wanted a magnified scope, we, we were like, all right, let's go in the armory. What do we have? Oh, fuck, let's grab this ACOG. Right. And it was, you can drive nails with that thing. And then everybody else had like aim points and EOTechs. I had an EOTech. I have an aim point. I had an aim point. Um, it's the M2, the comp M2. Um, I think you saw it the other day. That, that, that's, the, that's the one we used. It's the one I used. And, uh, you know, the EOTech with the double A batteries, the 512, I think is what it is. And a funny story how they came out with the, the 123 ver version. I think it was some Navy guys that came out with that. So it's funny how we won't even consider a 512 now, huh? We're like, oh, yeah. I, I don't want a 512. Give me a, what do you do? If it's not an XP, XPS3, I'm not even considering a 512. Yeah. And, yeah, that's 15 all we had. years ago, 512 was cutting edge. That, that's what we had. And, uh, and yeah, it's, and it worked and it worked <laughs> and it still works, you know? So, um, yeah, there wasn't a lot out there. So we had to really just grab, um, Europe had been doing different things for different reasons. We were trying to grab these other, like the Trigicon product that I mentioned, it's not a tactical scope at all. Like at all. It is a hunting safari scope. That's what it is. That's what it's for. All right, screw it. Put on an AR-15. Give me four power. Yeah, just give me one. Yeah. And it's a little kind of, I don't love this one, but all right, kind. Yeah, it works. You know, because the honest to God truth, it, it, those distances where you thought you needed one at that time, it was spray and pray, point the gun around the corner and full, put it on auto, you know, or it, at least what we were doing with them or what guys were doing with them. You know, if you knew you need, yeah, 40 bullets in the room to kill one guy. Okay, cool. It's because we ran out of hand grenades or something, you know? So it wasn't hostage rescue. I need to put one bullet. I'm not accountable for every bullet. Okay, kind of, but not really, you know? We're, we're reconning by fire by shooting a, a, a tank round down a street. I'm not worried about an extra couple bullets in the room, you know? Yeah. All right, so, all right, so you remember the original Schmittenbender short dot one to four. It, it, did it have exposed dials on it? The one that I had did. Yeah, and then so, but it didn't have a zero stop. No, and that's yeah, it didn't have it. So zero stops came on later on, and I remember my first night force didn't have a zero stop too. My first night force didn't. I don't think they came on to like eleven or twelve, right? Maybe not even then. Yeah, I remember. So when we got the first, we had night force scopes, right? You look back at the Chris Kyles and things like that. Those first night force scopes didn't have a zero stop. We we didn't really even have what we would consider now a standard mill mill reticle turret. So I remember getting scopes that had uh, a mill dot reticle and MOA turrets. Oh yeah. So the other day when James Yeager came down here and shot with me, 
um, his he gave his son in law, and I mean, this is where James, if you're listening, I mean, I'm married for 20 years, but if you maybe have another daughter, I might want to be your son in law, or maybe you adopt my daughter so I could be, I mean, my wife, so I could be your son in law. I mean, could we work this out somehow, James? Because I want that uh, rifle. I, I, I that, that's that what rifle. he's getting at. He wants this <laughs> rifle. It has so, nothing to do with anything else. So it was the uh, the 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 uh, Iron Brigade Armory, right? Mm. Colonel Norm Chandler. And it was cool. I got to talk to Bobby Hart last night about it. And uh, he told me how they were made. You know, Hart actually barreled the action for him. But, and they trued the action, which is really cool. But he had that original entire package. And it was like number 66 or something. And I'm like, why are you even shooting this? But really, you should shoot it. Um, but it had a Night Force 3 to 15 mm-hmm. mil dot MOA. Mm-hmm. Uh, turrets, which is funny because I was I was teaching them long range, and if you have never done MOA and you're trying to teach it, it's hard. I started in mil MOA, so I was like, oh, this is where I started. Yeah, here, Joey, let me help you. I'll show you how to do this. Where the newer guys are like, what? This is MOA mil? How does this even make sense? I got to throw the scope. I'm like, no, no, no. This is where it came from. Yeah, this like, is what we had. Yeah. There was no when, mil mil. When people were actually getting shot with sniper rifles on the regular, this is how it worked. <laughs> this, is, this is what it was doing. They did the mil dot. Yeah, he's uh, this far away and it was milling for range or maybe hold. And then it would be like, all right, you got to dial this many clicks or whatever. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean... Just because we used it then doesn't mean, I mean it was the best. It was what was available, and industry has really come around to now looking at what our requirements are. And we have, uh, as a as a force, have really got back to what are our requirements and, and trying to be a little more forward leaning because there is a time lag. And is again, as much as it's important to us now, we like it. This is what we have. We can put our fingers on it. I mean. Uh, do I want an LVPO or do I want better body armor? I'll take better body armor right now. You know, so do I need an MRAP or do I need better? Okay, I need an MRAP or the next tank or whatever. I need next drone. I mean, that's, you know. We've covered a lot of ground here with some history. It's actually kind of interesting, this history. All right. We, we know that the military, like, does data studies on ticks, right? Troops in combat. And they do these data studies to try to save lives. Like, you know, how, what would be a better tactics, what would be better equipment, what would be better, so on and so forth. And so this is kind of why we believe that the the military has kind of pushed over to having an LPVO. Um, And so so describe some of the reasons and and some of the things that you see and is why, because an LPVO does not make you shoot better. Mm -hmm. It just makes you see better. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? So, you know, as we do these after action reports and, and our lessons learned in all these different types of environments, I think the the glaring, you know, one of the data points that they pull out is like, was the enemy using cover or concealment? And yes, is the resounding answer, right? So, you know, imagine looking out there, we, we spend a lot of time on flat ranges and even us, when we do our qual courses, we'll spend time on a flat range and the silhouette pops up and it's a big green silhouette and everything else around it is brown. There it is, duh. So I, I think, Mike, that's something that a lot of us, because we watch movies, don't really understand. Because I think when you are playing Call of Duty and you you have your, your gun and you think, you know, American SHTF, bad guys coming into your house, whatever, you think that that's a guy inferior to your skills who's going to stand broadside looking at you or straight chested looking at you and just wait for you to shoot him. Mm -hmm. Is that the case at all with, with, yeah, I think, (laughs) I think you mean, you can watch the videos you can, or, you know, the clips on, you know, Al Jazeera on these guys, you know, jumping out with a a PKM machine gun from around the corner and go down a hallway. And then they put their head back in. They didn't stand out there and say, well, okay, now it's your turn. Shoot back. You know, now, were they out there for a split second with a PKM? Yeah, because they couldn't shoulder it. They're having to use a carry handle, and they're shooting it from the hip, and they're firing down a thing, right? So what did you do during that time? You probably put your head down. So by the time you picked your head back, ah, oh, damn it, he walked away. You know, he wasn't there anymore, or what have you. So, you know, the enemy doesn't want to die anymore, and we want to die, right? So, you know, you're getting in a, you're getting, you're going on a shooting range, and it's a, it's a two-way shooting range now. So think about that when you're shooting at a target at your local gun range or whatever, oh man, I shot that Ipsic target 500 yards. Cool. How much am I showing up? Well, if I just did it, did you not think he can do it back to you if that's how much 
you know, you were exposed. So with the LVPOs, I think what we're seeing is the, as we've gone to, we need to be able to, one, our weapons have gotten more accurate. Our, we demand better accuracy of our weapons. We demand better accuracy of our ammunition. We, and we demand overmatch against our enemies, either current or, for, or future. And that means, you know, I want to engage them at, at a greater distance than they can engage me, right? Duh, right? I, I want to get, you know, reach matters, uh, even in a fist fight. So the LVPO gives you the ability to see that person. And then especially in, in the areas that we are now in uh, politically correct warfare, I guess is probably the, the best way of saying it, right? World War II, the bad guys were on that side of the fence. We were on this side of the fence for the most part. They were wearing a very different uniform. They looked different. They had a different helmet. And we didn't have LPVOs. We didn't have optics. We had machine guns. And we fired that direction when we thought they were in that building. And, and we still kind of do that. But our rules of engagement don't really allow us to do that. I need to positively identify, did that guy have a weapon? I remember this story about a guy, you know, he's there looking down a hall, uh, a road and it was, he was a, you know, and they had shot a guy. He had an RPG. He jumped up and he tried to shoot an RPG. Him. Fucking smoked him. Boom. Dead. Drops down. Other guys are around. They're like, that guy, they're kind of looking They're They go over and I'm like, Oh man. And but they weren't, and they're like, oh, they're going to smoke. They, they're obviously his friend. They're obviously probably bad guys too, but they're not holding a weapon. And then he's like, dude, I, I didn't, I couldn't shoot him. I couldn't shoot him. I was like, yeah, man, I guess, yeah, you, you know, you're not allowed to shoot him. And, and, and he, he didn't, he's just like, okay. No, I, I, I've heard a lot of stories coming back that you could have a guy that has an AK and his man robe and, rips off two mags at you, sets it down and walks into the crowd and you can be watching him from a drone and you cannot engage him anymore because he's no longer a threat. Yeah, he's no longer a threat. So, you know, we're in World War II. If you would have told my my grandfather, yeah, man, that, that German just dropped his machine gun and his buddies were over there. They'd have been like, cool, they're standing still. And they would have fucking waxed them, right? So it, it, it's just very different. Um, so, hey, and I'm going to say, I'm going to add this. I know this is off the, off the scope topic, but it's very different because... Americans, the pussification of America has made us very, very extremely soft. We weren't ever made to see war. And when they embedded cameramen and Al Jazeera over there and they started making that portion of it crimes over here, that, that was a huge mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, 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 one, your little softy heart can't handle it. And two, if we're going to put our guys over there, we need to put them over there to win. And in world war two, we did that. And then Vietnam, we started, not, and then now it's like, ooh, this is the kinder, friendlier, yeah. gentler war. Yeah, and there's always, there's two sides of it. There's always that, well, then we don't put the soldier in a position where, you know, he become and starts indiscriminately killing and then having, you know, issues with it down the road or whatever. So it's, all, it doesn't really matter how we got to it. it. It's like, I don't care. I mean, I care, but I don't care. I care that this is my rules and this is what I got to go forward with. Right. Like, and so, that's, and that's where the LPVO. So now I need to be able to identify that guy. Is that a guy holding a radio? Is that guy holding a, and he's calling in mortar fire, uh, you know, cause they're using a spotter or is he holding his, you know, I don't know, kid's toy. And we just don't see the kid right now. You know, who did I shoot? Um, was this guy holding an AK or was he just kind of, I don't know how to stick, I, you know, stupid shit, right? Because at 300 meters, you're like, oh my God, I don't know. It just all looks like a rubble or what have you. What is that guy doing? I don't know. Well, eight power on a VCOG or the Night Force, you know, one to eight attacker, I can kind of pretty good idea within the, within the range that my weapon is effective at, um, you know, beyond 300 meters, I can, I can, oh yeah, that's what he's holding. And he's holding a, I mean, he's got a PKM or he's got an RPK or he's got a, an AK or, Huh. I don't know. What does he have? Oh, oh man, he's got an M4. Oh, shit. We just left those for him? Oh, okay, cool. Or, oh, man, he's got a, a G36. Like, I, sometimes that is a key ID feature of what their weapon is, because especially now, you know, we're all kind of wearing the same kind of uniform-ish, you know, between other nations. So in the next competition, maybe that other side is wearing the same, you know, knockoff multicam 
OCP, if you would, camouflage. But he's carrying, uh, he's got a Kalashnikov type weapon. Uh, he must be a bad guy. Yeah. And then, and then also the, it, you talk about them, you know, cover, sitting, standing. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, so that's another thing that when we were talking about the the targets as we're looking at ranges. So you're, you know, you're, you're peeking and shooting around a corner. You know, you don't have a person to look at. You know, okay, I've, I've gotten to the point where I know there's, there's bad guys in that building. I don't have a JDM to drop on them and they're shooting at me. Why? Because I can see the multiple flashes and then I'm taking fire and they're shooting at me. Okay. I'm cleared. I need to kill these people or I need to not kill them. I need to stop them from shooting at me. I'm going to do that by returning fire. Okay, cool. Well, he's only sticking his head out around the corner, maybe. And the rest of his body's covered and he's 350 meters out and he's using his AK and he's spraying down at me. Well, what am I doing? I'm taking cover, right? how am I going to fire back at him? Am I just going to keep spraying and praying on the side of the building? Yeah, kind of, probably. That's probably what's going to happen unless I can accurately see him sticking his head out or whatever he's sticking out and put fire accurately on that position. And that's where an LVPO really is what it's good for. Identifying the target when he's covered because he's not going to stand in the window and just be flashing you. You know, he's not the flash. He's not going to, ah, hey guys, look at me, my man, whatever he's in. He's going to be trying to hide, especially if he's back farther in the room. If he has any type of tactical presence, you know, he's not going to make it easy for you because if he did, they'd be dead, right? Like the Dota bird's dead. Why? Because it was easy to freaking kill. Real simple. So, so, so now we have, um, a big push military wide to get LPVOs, right? Yeah. Whether it's the one by one to six or one to eight. And I, I'm going to argue the next ones are going to be one to tens. Somebody's going to figure out the one to 10 vortex kind of figured it out. Their one is still a little bit off, but they're really going to figure out the one to tens. Oh yeah. I mean, and you can tell that because, um, EOTech just dropped their one to 10. EOTech did so, so that's another, like, we'll see what it looks like at shot show. Hopefully they'll give us one to look at and play with. And you know, uh, it's going to be interesting. There's, there's drawbacks to every type of LVPO. I mean, physics are physics. You know, I used to tell people as an engineer, is like, well, I could lie to you and I can break the laws of physics. What do you want me to do? Like, these are my, kind of like my two choices here. I can't change optics. Now, there are some revolutionary things out there in science and technology that may change the way we look at what is an optic. But right now, when we look at prisms and mirrors and lenses, Okay, this is, you know, what you see is what you get kind of here. And there's trade-offs. Every time I want a wider field of view or more eye relief or less eye relief to make that LVPO optimized, um, you know, there's those trades. So we'll see how 1 to 10 goes. We'll see what the optical engineers come up with. We'll see what it looks like. The reticle designs, front focal plane, you know, for a second. I think every time you look at military, you're going to look at front focal. That's just the way they're going to go. Um, mm, I like second focal plane on, on 1 to 6 is 1 to 8 is better. Um, now I will say, I will say this, that EOTech, EOTech sent us a, an optic and Trijicon has sent us the, uh, VCOGs. Mm -hmm. Um, both of those really did figure out first focal plane. I think so too. Vortex. I have the vortex one to 10. They did not they figure did not. out. Exactly. Yeah, so, uh, and, and somebody was just commenting on that the other day on the sniper side. Hey, should I get this? And I'm, and I was like, you know. I don't like the one to 10. It yeah. did not work well for what I want. I like the one to 10 in the higher powers. Yes. I do not like it on one. It did not like it. But on I one. like the VCOG on one. I do too. Although the VCOG is having a lot of problems right now. They're breaking a lot. I, I like the second focal plane. One to six is better. Now that being said, I just got this EOTech. We haven't got to shoot with it. Just playing with it, I like it a lot. I do too. Yeah. I, that was, that's the one to six. It's got the illuminated reticle, yeah. and I also love EOTech because it, when we talk about red dots, that was the one that I, I that was my bread and butter. That was effectively my first, a f really good red dot that I ever had on anything outside of like one of my paintball gun, right? Like as a kid, um, and so I love the circle dot. That's just I'm always going to love the circle dot, and that's what I love about the VCOG is it's got the segmented circle dot on that one power. So it's super quick for me to pick up and uh, on one power, which I think is key. And then it works on 10 power or eight so, power. So kind of so kind of jumping into red dots right now. Now, um, when I was first 
my first red dot was an EOTech 512. Um, we had a real issue at the police department, right? They gave us just, we just had the Bushmaster and nothing. And then, then they started saying, okay, you cannot have a magnified optic at all, but you could have a red dot. And I think that's the case for still a lot of police departments. You can have a magnified, I mean, you can have a red dot, but not a magnified optic. So our first ones that we got were EOTechs. I got an EOTech 512. You know, they had like 900 hours battery life. You had to turn them on. They shut off a lot. And so that's why you saw a lot of guys still having front posts on their guns. Because if your EOTech sight went off in the middle of a fight, you can still fight because you had your front post sight on. Yeah, and you had to flip up back up. Yeah. I mean, so that's what. And you and flipped. you don't you don't actually need so just so you guys know you don't actually have to have your flip up back up to finish a fight. Mm -hmm. Just having your front sight. If you can just focus on that front sight, you'll be surprised to the to the range that you had to shoot somebody before you could get out of the way, just your front sight's going to hit them. Oh yeah. Especially if you have consistent, uh, you know, head positioning, I mean, yeah, done. Yeah. yeah. Gonna, boop, boop, yeah done. You're going to hit them. And then, and then, you know, that's why we always say front sight focus. Just have why. Yeah, no. Yeah. And so then, you know, came out the, the aim point started getting really popular because they started making the smaller ones mm -hmm. and they, they last 50,000 hours. You can, they last five years. And then or so it was one, one double a battery. Yeah. I mean, or one, was, double yeah a battery. one double a battery. And I could keep a bunch of them in my butt stock um, or my pistol grip or whatever. I mean, that's that M2. That's what it was. One double yeah. a battery. And so right now what I've seen is there's uh, some army SOCOM guys that are now switching to the T2. Um, a lot of them. And the reason why is because they can just turn it on and leave it on versus the EOTech. And then there's the dieharders like, like you that are, and you know, I got a bunch of, a bunch of my friends that are gunfighters, they all want the EOTech. Wider field of view, and it does have a wider field of view, so hitting a moving target is way easier. I wouldn't say way easier. It is easier. Um, I would argue with anybody that having that bigger circle, if you just get that on something, you're going to hit it. And that's what we did, too. So I, why I love the, the EOTech is, a, is and, and I had both, and I chose the EOTech after playing with both of them, was because of that circle. So when we were standing and you had to snap your rifle up and get it in, get around a corner because you couldn't, you know, even a 14 inch gun, especially with a suppressor or anything, like you wasn't a Mark 18. It wasn't that small. You, you know, you needed to, there wasn't a compressed high ready. Like we were still figuring some of this stuff out. It was kind of a high ready or a low ready and you had to snap your rifle up. So finding the, the dot quickly was important, you know, and that circle just allowed you to not get focused on the two MOA dot that we had on the aim points, but it had one, a smaller, finer one MOA dot. So I need to shoot a little farther or a little bit more precise. I could, but the circle just put the circle. Was it on there? It kind of like shotgun. Yep. In there, get it, get after it. And so I really love that about the EOTech, but you're right. I mean, the batteries died faster. Uh, I had, corrosion issues i had to swap out the the springs and stuff on my 512 they fixed all that with the you know oh yeah i'd say the the latest eotech yeah. optic is it's it's way different than when i started with yeah it, they're they're it's bad to the even, bone i, I would close. not the only the only hiccup i have with an eotech right now is that it turns itself off in eight hours i don't like that for a home defense gun for a duty use, going back as a police officer, I'd absolutely take it. Yeah. And then my other issue is I got a really bad stigmatism. And I know that this is a, hey, you got a stigmatism, blah, blah, blah. It's a big deal to me. I can't see past 50 meters. Yeah. Yeah. Past 50 meters, the whole thing is just a red blur to me. Yeah. That's, that's on me. That's not on the scope company, right? Yeah. Aim point's the same way. I see three dots in an aim point. But when I'm shooting fast, it doesn't matter. Those three dots, I still put it on the target. Yeah. Um, that's why I like an LPVO better now because I see better with it. Oh, yeah. And I think so it's interesting when we talk about LVPOs and red dots and and, and what the purpose is. So a, another big consideration with a, an LVPO or a red dot is are you shooting at night or do you need to be able to shoot at night? Right. Like so. If let's just remove the laser from the equation, because we'll just say that it may not be tactically uh, smart to have a laser um, in near peer competition or something like that. So I need to now look passively through my optic or my sighting system. Uh, with an LVPO, I need to do a clip on in the front, right? So that limits it. You've seen, if you guys watch some of the stuff, we, I use the skeet. I like the thermal skeet. There are night vision ones that clip on, but I can't use my goggle now. 
So if I'm using an EOTech or a red dot, I can look through the back end. I found it was easier for me with, with nods to look through an EOTech than an aimpoint. But I would also say that was because at the time we were not using the real high optic mounts that we have available now. Yeah. So I have the unity mount. I have EOTech. <clears throat> I have all three unity mounts, right? The, e the EOTech mount, the aim point mount and the LPVO mount. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed with my PBS 31s, I got the latest generation of PBS 31s. I shoot really well through the EOTech. I shoot really well through, um, the aim point, I can't hardly shoot the freaking thing at all with a scope. Like, yeah, no, I, I just I, can't. Yeah, I can't shoot the scope either. It's yeah. on that one, and I, I was like, yeah, nope, nope, I can't. I, do can't this. I can't do it. This is too high for me. All right, so LVPO is shooting passively. I don't know if everybody understands what shooting passively means, so kind of explain, explain passively and laser discipline, and why you know why you may or may not would use a laser. So. You know, laser discipline is just like light discipline. You know, you turn your laser on when you need it, you turn it off when you don't, right? So you're not just walking around with your laser. And that that's twofold. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of eye safeness because obviously ours are not necessarily eye safe, which is why they're regulated military, not civilian. But also, so you don't give away your position. This laser is just shining off into space and whittling around and you're flagging your, you know, whatever, right? Yeah, and you can really see it, like, Yo. If, if you could be, a, I don't know, half a mile from me, and if I'm shining my laser in the air and you're under nods. Oh, well, no, nah, if, if you take an LA-5 and you shine it in the air at a mile, you're going to be like, oh, there it is. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, you'd be giving away your position. You should just, like, turn it on a, a mod light or something like that. Which is a big deal now because, I mean, we literally just gave a bunch of latest generation night vision to our enemy. Yeah, I want to know if, say, it's the latest generation based on the pictures of it, but it's night vision. Yeah, it's good enough to see the, the it, laser. Exactly, <laughs> it's good enough to see the laser. So um, so that would be laser discipline. Shooting passively would be not using that laser. So you know, normally when we shot at night, we would effectively hip shoot with the laser, what, what you would think a laser sight would be used for. And you would use your nods and you keep your head up and you keep your gun kind of low or whatever and you could just, you could hip shoot it. Work just fine. Um, Shooting passively is where you're you're not using any you're not projecting any type of light source uh, IR or not a, out of your out of your rifle platform or your weapon platform or whatever it is. So you'd have to be looking through your scope or whatever sighting system you have. Yeah, which is why you know PVS thirty ones or PVS fourteen any tubed night vision looking through even with a unity mount on an a one to six or an LPVO. Oh, you can't do it because I relief. It's yeah. just, you just can't do it. Yeah. And not to mention recoil. Yeah. You're just going to scope yourself with your own night vision. Like, yeah. It will not work. Yeah. It just, I, I realize somebody's going to be like, Oh, but I really do do it. I realize that the range, you could, you can you like could, hold it like, up. You could get do it, it done, yeah, but, but it you doesn't. can't effectively do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can effectively do it on a aim point or a EOTech. EOTech absolutely. As especially. long as you got the riser. Yes. Okay. So there are, um, a couple, a couple of different scenarios. So we, we understand now, you know, to this point kind of where, like why, like the history of how we got to the current um, yeah. LPVO, which the current LPVO is a, is about half the guys are using the one to eight night force attacker and about half are using the. Yeah. So well, I mean, when you look at programs of record or, you know, supported by a syscom uh, somebody that is provide but guys are not unit issue buying stuff right so you have socom it's the night force attacker one to eight right it's okay yeah yep. look up the press release the other one is the marine corps it's the vcog also look up the press release right so and then it, the interim in that while they were looking a lot of guys have been getting the one to six vortex razor yeah but that was ne that was never you know syscom supported right so when we say that it means it goes back to the factory for refurb or whatever that was a unit just like that Castle War Money that I talked about where we got our other Trijicons or Schmitz or whatever, we were just buying them. And, and if it broke, it broke. And maybe it was between you and the unit, uh, you know, your unit to work out with the manufacturer, however you did it, right? So there, it breaks, it breaks. Um, and that's that's something that I'll, I know if, you, if you're not familiar with the military and their process, you know, you don't understand that they, they may have to buy something just to get them by while they're waiting on something 
yeah, that they're actually going to use. A lot of times, you know, you'll have you have programs, and you may have interim solutions. A lot of times, interim t- solutions turn into a solution based on how long the RDT process works. But the uh, those are just the, I need something now, and so we we they bought something, right? So yes, uh, the other one that would be out would be like the Sig um, from the Army. So the Army st- still has gone like the Sig route on that. They have not done either one of the other two as far as actual variable optics. ACOGs are still out there though. Um, and LCANs, we could talk, you know, that is kind of, I, that's a switchable optic. It has one or four. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's really an LPVO, although it kind of fits in the category. I like it. I, I know um, a lot of the guys in the Army that I've visited with, they really like it. I know a lot of your Navy guys didn't like it. Yeah, there's pros and there's that specific optic has some great pros and cons. It's used overseas wild, widely, which is where it came from. You know, we saw Brits and Aussie, uh, these other people have, them. wait a minute. You can have a one and a four or a one and the one, the six is admittedly a lot bigger. The four is that sweet spot on size. It's really nice. Um, you know, my personal experiences with it have been, it, it doesn't, I don't maintain zero with it because of the way it's elevation knob works on the bottom. It's pretty easy to move. So you get one that's got a lot of miles on it. Um, it can, it can bump around too easily. Now the way to get around that is marking it and then going, Oh, that's my hundred. And what it's got, it's, it's a double edged sword because you don't know, see the army guys, they'll mark their hundred then they'll turn it and there's their 200 and then they'll turn it again and they'll mark a different color. That's their 500, whatever it needs to be. And they know, even though they could use the stadia lines inside of the optic, they just turn the thing and now they just hold right on the center and now they can just hold wind if they needed to at farther distances, or it just makes it easier. Oh, I'm constantly getting engaged here. Or you can also set it where it's, you can take it on and off. Hey, here's my, here's my M four zero. Here's my seven, six, two, zero right? Um, whatever, pick a, a 7.62 platform that you may have had. So, or here's my 14 inch and here's my 10 inch. And I wanted to run the same optic on either one. I could take it off and go, oh, yeah, yeah. My, my Mark 18, I'm going to run this because I, I want to, right? It's, you can still run LVPO on Mark 18s and I, it's the blue mark. And then I turn it to the red mark and that's my 14 five moving on, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so I really like the Elkin. I yeah. really do. It's a, it's a good optic. Um, all right, let's, let's bring it down. Let's bring it to America. Right. right. Now we know that, um, we've, we've kind of talked the history of LPVOs. We know that they're they're They've kind of come to that one to eight. We think they're probably going to come to a one to 10. Um, now that we're not in war anymore, um, we effectively haven't been at war since 2016. And so the global war on terror is over. I, I guess it's technically over by the center. It's over. Yeah, right? I mean the, the way they, they they do their campaigns or whatever, right? So, um, yeah, sure. Shit, but there's still going to be. Oh in, yeah, there's still going to be little t- stuff, but it's yeah, over. We're, we're not at war anymore. We're okay? not deploying massive forces overseas. So now we're going to see this push of military stuff that like like solving problems that weren't actually there. And so you got to find out: are did is are we going to be buying good ideas, or are we going to be buying good products? And so there's going to be a a whole new level of effectively junk that can come to the market along with great options that'll come to the market. I think a great option is going to be the one to 10. All right now. So let's sync this back. All right. So the people that are listening to this are, are average Americans. They might be law enforcement. Um, Let's talk about where does the LVPO versus the red dot fit in for us here in America. And I think first on that situation is we have to realize we are not in Afghanistan, right? We are in Dallas, Texas, Mm -hmm. you know, we're in Austin, Texas. Our primary weapon is actually our pistol. You should be carrying CCW every day and your primary weapon is a pistol. Um, now I, I would always like to say how I was trained is my pistol should fight me to my rifle, but Mm. in reality in America, not having a badge on my pistol is my primary period. It just is. Yeah, Cause if I can't solve the problem in the seven to 10 rounds that I may have there, uh, it's, I, need to, I need to be moving. Yeah. It's a really the big problem. <laughs> yeah, right? We're not problem getting out that I need to be running. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I, so I really look at this and I say, yes, we have to think about what is possible and what is probable. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. What is probable in an American gunfight is I'm going to get into it with my Glock 48. Mm-hmm. Right. If I'm going to get in a gunfight, it's going to be my Glock 48. And it's more than likely probable that it's going to be in the law of threes. Three seconds, three rounds, three feet. It's going to be over real quick, real Boom, fast. Boom. It's over. Right. Yeah. 
just think about this. We're not running One, the streets. two, it's over. Yeah. That's a gunfight in America. One, two, it's over. We want to think it's like uh, Lone Survivor Marcus Luttrell and people hanging up there, we're going to shoot. That's the, that isn't how it works. Or North Hollywood. North Hollywood has not happened again since North Hollywood. And it would have been really over very quickly had we had LVPOs on AR-15. Yeah, should cops at them. <laughs> it would have been over real quick, right? Or, real quick. or better sniper teams, uh, yeah. right? Any sniper team today would roll up and just pop them. Yeah. Right or today, the average deputy would just roll up and pop them. Yeah, it'd, it'd just, be over quickly. Be like whack, done. Yeah. Thank you. And in that, let's just say that happened. Let's just go down that because it could be probable that mm -hmm. you see some, you know, freaking terrorists that are holding up and shooting Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. Right? Whenever he would, they, that guy went a little bit crazy and was shooting people, shooting cops. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get it. So we have to say that that's probable. Mm -hmm. um, if that's probable that's probably something that a cop's going to take care of. If they're sitting there dropping multiple rounds, you as a family man, as a dad need to be saying, I need to get my kids out of here as a civilian on the civilian side. You need to be saying, how can I get as many pedestrians away from this as possible? Mm -hmm. Because if all you have is your pistol and you're trying to engage a guy with a rifle, you lose. If all you have, maybe you, maybe you have your rifle. Maybe you're super guy. You're Superman. You have your prepper. You're ready. Oh, or we're just driving through Dallas and I have my truck and I'm like, well, you just came back from hunting and we'll go back to the house. And like, yeah, what the heck? All right. If there's two or three of them and you, you still lose. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, it's still uh, overwhelming firepower still wins the day every day. That's so. right. So you still lose that. And so um, what is possible and what is probable? It's possible that there's red dawn, right? It's truly possible that the aliens come like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. there, it, there's a lot of things that can be impossible in your, in your head. Raid, raid the armory, get the Dylan mini. Done. That's right. That's, yeah. That's the right answer on that one. But that's, that's not, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. the chances of that happening are like, that's almost not what nothing. you need to be prepared. For. It's not what you need to be preparing for. So what do you need to be preparing for? I like to say, okay, home defense, number one, right? Okay. Home defense for home defense. Now you, you, you're an American, you, you, you live in America, you, you, know, mm -hmm. you have home defense, and then you've also been out of country doing the job. Yeah. For home defense, LPVO or red dot? Oh, it's red dot. Red dot, yeah. yeah it's because it's, it, it's all close stuff, right? And it's super close. Even the military guys, you guys would be using a red dot in EOTech. Oh, yeah, if you for knew CQB. I was going, in, so that's why like I said earlier, I had a 10 inch and I had a red dot, and then I had my 14 and I had an LVPO. So, if I knew I was going into, and I know there's people out there who say, well, don't set up your rifle to for what you think you're going to do because you might have to run it. Yes, I get that. But that was very early on when they didn't know what they were held, what was going on. You know, if you're in my house, we know what's going on. I don't need to worry about now engaging you at a couple hundred meters, you know, or if I'm coming in to take your house, we rolled up with fun V's and mini guns. I'm between the fun V and the, or, you know, the LATV or whatever. And, the house we're shooting zero distance, right? So I need, I need a red dot. Um, so if you know your environment, that's a done. Yeah. But to me, it's the EOTech. If you're going to, you know, like, and I know you, you're the aim point guy. I'm yeah. So, guy and, and here's the difference in that. Okay, guys, I say, I'm going to take an aim point T1, T2, something like that. I have a T2 for my personal defense gun. I don't even have a magnified optic on it. I have an aim point. I don't have a, a night vision set up on it because if somebody comes, knocks on my door in the middle of the night, kicks it in, I'm going to have a flashlight. Now I'm not a big believer in having a flashlight, but I want the flashlight because in you come in my house and I'm turning on lights because I need to see my kids. Mm -hmm. I need to make sure that that wasn't my teenager that walked in in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Got snuck in with yep. a boyfriend and I just popped them. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm turning on my light and turning on lights as I go. Yeah, right? absolutely. And I'm pieing corners and making sure I'm doing it correct, but I'm turning on lights as I go. Well, and the other thing I think too, when we think about home defense is they either know you're there or don't know you're there. And in my mind, as soon as I start flipping lights on and they have it run at that point, now we're in it to win it. Yeah, yeah. Because and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. Is it like, um, are they there to do you harm? Like, like, it's better for me. Like, if you broke into my house in the middle of the night and I turned on a light and you ran away, that was better for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was I should not me. need to get in the gunfight. Now, I get it. There's, there's stories of they're yelling at you because they think you don't have a weapon. I mean, you clearly didn't do your job as a, as a criminal by looking at my house and going, 
probably don't want to rob that 200 pound animal. You know what I mean? Like that's a bad idea to get in a fist fight, you know? So, but I get it. There's those people that are like, I'm, I have a gun. I'm going to call the cops. And they still try to come through the door. Mostly they're doped out of their gourd, right? Oh, like yeah, they yeah. don't have a fucking clue what's going on. So yeah, to me, white light, because you can also use it, you know, from, we learned how to distract people with it too. I'm sure I know cops do it. Oh yeah. 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 We'd learned it. We had the dazzlers. We had everything else. We shine the white, especially that mod. Like, Oh my gosh, that is like, Oh, so yeah. White light. Absolutely. Red dot. But I almost even argue inside your house and even your red dot. You probably don't, but we do know that the red dot makes you shoot better. It, it does. does. It does. So Especially in, in my house under stress, I want to shoot better. So I'm taking a red dot. Yeah. I'm taking the aim point because I want the five years of battery life on an EOTech. Somebody just woke you up in the middle of the night and now you have to say, get up or the wife wakes you up. Holy cow. There's somebody inside my house. Get up, shake around. Crap. Can I put my pants on? Do I put my pant, my shoes on? Do I, I at least say, put your shoes on. You can run it out side naked. It's fine. Where's my gun? I grab my gun. Is my gun loaded? Yes, it's loaded. Where's the light? Turn on the light. Shake my head up some more. I don't want to have to say, turn on my EOTech. Yeah. yeah. That's why I don't have it. Yeah. No, I get that. I mean, so I just, I don't necessarily have the A. I mean, I do, but I'm, I'm going to grab my, grab my pistol out of the, the safe. It's right there. Okay. And yeah. And, 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 and so I was because talking, I'm not looking to shoot somebody because I, it's I, a I, little different. If, even if a crackhead comes into my house, they're gonna be like, you have so much training and you're so like, if there's four crackheads. We're good because they've got me if I don't do something. But if it's one and they were like, Really, Mike? You didn't go over there and pop that guy in the face? No. So, I, I mean, I realize that that's an argument that they would use against you. It's not one that I have. I have that argument that if you came into my house because I have three children and a wife, oh, yeah, if you got me, me you were going to get them. Exactly. So, um, I don't have the issue at that point anymore. But what I do want is I want my gun to work and I want it to be scientifically correct. So, I want my, I want my battery already on, ready to shoot this guy as he comes in. And so, I leave a, I If you don't if you don't leave your gun loaded, I'm okay. I like, I keep a round in my pistol all the time, but in my law enforcement time, I learned to keep my rifle and my shotgun cruiser ready, which yeah. means I had to rack it. Yeah. Now I know every military gunfighter I've ever talked to. He's like, that's a dead man's gun. I get it. I get it. You know, it's so funny too, because in my gun that sits next to my bed, I don't, I, it, the, I keep it in cruiser ready. My ARs, I would keep them locked ready with safety on. And I think it's just the difference between having the kids the way and where I put my firearms and how I can store them. Be, and I, you can shoot yourself easier with a pistol than you can a rifle, right? So, And I also know that my smaller kids can't pick up or maneuver my AR. But I, typically for me inside the house, it is a handgun or it's my KSG shotgun because uh, of a lot of good reasons. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of funny. I, I actually run my pistol because- We run them reverse, that's funny. Because I can also press check it instantly. I can go- ch -ch -ch No, no, I get it, I get it. And, and, and you start harder. making some noise and some people are start realizing because once again, we'd like them to leave. Yeah. I, I, I subscribed for a very long time on I would keep a pistol because I had little kids and I needed to open doors and I needed to grab little kids. And then I was talking to a guy, a very accomplished shooter, and he's like, hey, man, I, I use a pistol caliber carbine. And I'm like, dude, what? Why wouldn't you just use a pistol? And he's like, because you know how hard it is to make those long shots, like a 20-yard shot. And I'm like, yeah, but, but you are this guy. And Doesn't he, matter. And he's like, no, no, no. He said, I'll make the shot better with a rifle. And I said, mm, done. So I switched it. So mine is a 300 blackout, little short yep. with a can and an EOT, I mean, and an aim point on top of it that stays on all the time. And it still gives me the ability to, if I, I may, you may need to make a CNS shot because they've got one of your family members. I can do that. I'm not going to get that with a pistol. And I'm just telling you, I realize if you're listening to this, you think you're super sniper, operator, SEAL team, Delta Force, CAG, whatever. You think you're that guy. I promise. And a, when your heart is beating, you know, 200 beats a minute and you're so freaking scared, you have no idea what's going on and you have tunnel vision, you're not going to make that with your Glock 19 across the hallway or across like my house right here is 20 yards across. I'm, I have a hard enough time just hitting the target with a pistol and I can shoot a pistol at 20 yards. Oh, and that's why like it's a mine is laser light and an, uh, and an RMR on top of it. 
because I'm giving myself every opportunity to be able to hit that. Like yeah, I yeah, cite yeah. them indifferently, but anyway, yeah, I mean, you're right. The, the a stocked weapon platform, PCC, AR, even a shotgun is going to be more accurate than a handgun. Yeah. It's just, it, it, and it's going to be faster for follow up and whatever. So, you know, it's kind of that balance between where you live, what you have, how far you're shooting. You live in a McMansion. Do you live in a, you know, a tiny little room? Because I don't need an AR 10 yards. Like, uh, I don't need an AR 7 yards. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I, I, I kind of think that there's, there's sure a lot of options. Like, there's no wrong answer between pistol, AR, shotgun. I choose the AR because I have teenagers and the chance of maybe making a precision shot inside my house is probably more than me just making a pistol Mm -hmm. center mass shot. And I just don't like shotguns. Yeah. I mean, shotguns do the work. They do a good job, but I just don't like them. Um, I just think AR small ARs are better than a shotgun now, but AR has gotten so small now and you know, with, whatever you want to call the back ends, you know, and then the way that we're going to do. And you know, let me tell forms. you, so you just guys don't miss this. When I tell you that I don't like a shotgun, I have grown up shooting a shotgun. I shot it for a job and I still shoot a shotgun more than most people that you'll ever meet in your life. I have zero problems reloading a shotgun. Very, I'm very good with it. I quail hunt. I dove hunt. I duck mm-hmm. hunt. I goose hunt. I can load a shotgun blind. I can load it very fast. I can shoot the hell out of a shotgun. Um, but it's just not my choice. But, yeah. but if I had one, would I feel at a disadvantage? No, no, I just like my little one better. But so that is the, all right. So at home, we both agree. You don't need an LPVO. You need a red, red dot, dot no magnifier, red dot. And if you're whatever. Yeah. And I still stick with that at home because listen, guys, you do not want to chase a bad guy out of your house and still shoot him. You're going to go to jail for that. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. You do not do Unless that. Unless he's got one of my kids and then that one's a little yeah, that's story. different, but that's, that's, you know, he's got my TV. I mean, good luck. Good, bro, you run, can I could probably run him down and be like, bro, really? <laughs> and punch him in the face and yeah. then take it. Um, now, so the other side of this is there's going to be people that are like, all right, let's go into the the prepper side of this, right? Let's mm-hmm. go into um, another Bundy Ranch or let's go into a um, Red Dawn or American Collapse when we lose the grid or any of this. At that point in time, are you LVPO or are you red dot? That's a tough one. Um, so I really like a red dot for a lot of close work fast or things that I'm going to have to to do like that. But it has its limitations, identifying targets, precision shots. I like the Eotech because it has the one MOA dot, right? So now... That being said, it needs a magnifier in that situation. So if you say LVP, if you say red dot with a 3X magnifier, yeah, I kind of like that, right? But uh, what I have on mine is a one to eight. <laughs> so. Yeah, so that's where I stick with it, Mike. Is it, I, so I, I, I literally think that this goes back to the professional system. If you have not seen our YouTube, you need to go look at it. The last American Outlaw on YouTube we did a professional carbine setup, right? Mm-hmm. And a professional carbine setup for those of you who aren't going to go watch YouTube, like I'm asking you to, um, actually you need to go look at it, but you need a professional setup, which would include two uppers. But my, my choice would be if I could only have one, I'm going to choose an LP, LVPO. And the reason why is because I don't have the option of being with a team of 80 dudes when we pop something. I'm going to be me and three or four kids. I'm going to be me and five or six neighbors and a couple of kids. Mm -hmm. And my strength in any of those situations is distance. Distance and precision. Because the other thing, I mean, in all of those situations, right, in America, shit hit the fan, right? So if shit's hit the fan, well, we have an ammo shortage now. What do you think it's going to be later? You're not going to be spraying and praying and and like, oh, they're in that building, recon by fire. All right, put some rounds up. Like, with who? You and your sister? You know, like... What, me and my three kids and your three girls? Like, we both got three girls. Mine can't barely pick up the AR-15. You know what I mean? At least yours, we'd be able to be like, fire that direction, right? So if I had to pick up a, a, a rifle to put in my safe to give to, like, one of your girls or my wife or your wife, I'd give them a red dot and be like, turn this on, put dot on target, and point over that way and fire. Don't shoot until I tell you to, please. You know? And I'd give them one mag. And the other one would be like, okay, don't use that other one. But for me, I want the LVPO. And I think it also comes down to... Okay, now it's like the zombie apocalypse and like the world has come to an end and like, oh wait, now we can't get Duracell batteries? Like, 
because the other, the, the Vcog, for example, it's the what it's uh, the one the Marine Corps picked, uh, the one to eight and one to six, and uh, and I have one on mine. And, you know, it has a battery. It has a twenty thirty two on it. It'll last forever if I turn the illumination on, but it still works if I turn the illumination off or if I take the battery completely out. And because it's durable, I don't. It still works. Where that EOTech, I get water in there or an aim point, whatever it is, even five-year battery life. What if I got water intrusion for some reason, right? Like there's military ones that get water intrusion. That's why they go through government acceptance testings before they actually hit the fleets uh, and the fields. But they still can, you can still get that problem. And now it's dead. It's completely useless. It's just a, a tube with some stuff in there. The other one's etched reticle. Okay. You know what I mean? It's just, mm, Okay. All right, so in order to wrap this up, what is the best, an LVPO or a red dot? Here's what I'm going to say, and I'm going to let Mike give his. I'm going to say I want two uppers. I want one with a one to eight or a one to six um, and a 14 and a half inch barrel, and that would be my daytime out, you know, SHTF. And then I want a uh, one that is, you know, 11 and a half with a suppressor, and uh, a T2 so that I can leave it on all the time and it's in my house. Um, and it's got to have the, uh, it's got to have that higher uh, side line. So it's got to be sitting at like two, two and a quarter height. No, it doesn't have to be because I'm not going to have night vision when somebody breaks into my house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, and now, you know, hey, you need a CQB gun? Like, okay, then give me a laser, give me a LA-5 or give me an NGAL and then give me the T2 and then give me the the Unity mount, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that's a different deal. Because in SHTF, I don't want to do, I do not plan to do CQC. That's a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. We don't have enough guys to do CQC. We need 30 dudes to hit a house, yeah. not, not two or three or four. And I need a lot of bullets. And a lot of bullets. And we don't have that luxury because when you're out of bullets, you're out of bullets. All right. If I could only do, like, if you're like, dude, I cannot afford two uppers and I cannot afford two optics, my deal is going to be get an Aimpoint T2. And um, I would, for this one, growing into it, because you can only afford to get one, I would get the Unity mount. And then I would buy the Aimpoint Pro 3 power, not 6 power, 3 power magnifier with the Unity mount because it folds down right behind the optic. Um, and that's why I would do that. Not for passive shooting, but because it folds behind the optic and it's not sticking out everywhere. And I'd get an 11 and a half with a, or I'm sorry, I would get a, uh, 14 and a half with a can. And if I couldn't afford a can, I'd still stick with the 14 and a half till I could. That's where I would stay. If I could only have, have one, give me a, give me a T2A and give me a three power magnifier for the United States for what we're going to see today that could bleed over into SHTF. So what's your, what's yours? All right, so I think that's a really good setup there, um, you know, especially as the one all around. I don't think it does anything great. I don't think it gives up a lot anywhere. Um, I, I think that's a really good to grow into setup. Um, I think that that aim point, so I would go, if you, you know, we're talking, I can only afford one. Well, I would probably still go to the EOTech because it's a little bit easier to learn, in my mind, a little bit easier to learn. You can get one that's already, you know, relatively not heads up completely. They do make the unity mount that breaks it up even higher, but it, they're also tend to be a little less expensive than the aim points when it comes to red dots. And I know there's hollow suns and there's other optics out there, but the, uh, the XPS three, the non night vision capable, uh, version is less expensive t- right around that 500 where your T series on your aim points are around like seven to $800 mark. Right. So I think the new EOTechs though are up there about seven, seven fifty now. Right. If you get the night vision capable ones. Yeah. Right. So if we're not talking that, and I know now aim point does make a non night vision. Uh, I think it's the H series. Right. Yeah. So, but, um, I st- have kind of always been more in that EOTech realm because I really, really love the circle dot. Um, it, you know, quickly on that one is you can zero at one and you can have a zero at the other at the bottom of the circle, right? Like that's kind of cool. Uh, there's other reticles out there. I know primary arms is doing a lot with theirs, uh, with their reticle systems. So that's really cool. However, I trust my EOTech and my Aimpoint brands more than I trust all the other ones. And so when I'm thinking if I only had to do, if I could only do one, that would probably be the one I would have and then grow into a, you know, a unity mount because it's a little less expensive on the EOTech. And then again, a 3X only magnifier because again, like you said, it drops down below because that was the biggest draw side with the, the side flip mount or twist lock magnifiers is if it was a twist lock, you put it in your pocket, you dropped it, you broke it, you lost it. 
If it was a side flip, it inevitably flipped it when you didn't need it or you snagged it on crap. But with the way Unity has raised theirs and their mount design for their magnifiers allows it to drop straight down, you still have a streamlined rifle. However, I think that there's still a very good argument and, and arguably probably better to go with um, a less expensive LVPO. I think the hardest part is you're not going to touch a quality LVPO for under $1,000. Yeah, no, I agree. And I don't even know if you're – because of COVID and shipping and stuff, those $1,000 ones have turned to like 15 now. Yeah, and, and even if you find like a used – so if I were to say like uh, – I, I hate to even say it, but one that has done well in the past would be that Razor 1 to 6, and you typically can find them – for 13 and then you can find them used or like a you know deal or whatever for like 11 i saw one the other day i was like oh it's 1100 i don't personally like that scope i don't like the reticle in it um we looked at it and i and i don't personally like it however it is pretty durable that that scope from from vortec does pretty darn well money being no object or not even that if money being no object to be it'd probably be one of the schmitz um, the dual. Oh yeah, but it's, it's five grand. Exactly. It's, yeah, like you I, said, money being no yeah, I was looking at one the other day. They're bad to the bone, but still I would not choose that as my one. And if I can only have one and only afford one, I would still choose the red dot and the magnifier because you do not want an LVPO in your house. Okay. I mean, I know it will work, but it's not my choice. I would rather have a red dot. No, I, I get because that. you know, I just would, if I was going to have a rifle, and I know if I, if I, the first gun I buy is a pistol. First gun I bought, I bought myself, I should say, was a pistol that I could, when I was 21, obviously all the rifles and shotguns and stuff I could buy myself when, that I had. Um, so when I'm thinking rifle, I, I'm, I'm, to me, I'm giving up the ability for that red dot engagement zone in my house because I am gaining the distance that I may need somewhere else because in my house, I'm going to still use my pistol. And I know why we still don't do those other things because in my house, I'm not as worried about having to get in that, that gunfight if I would, because I can flip the lights on, I can turn everything on, I can yell at them. I can use other means. So, so in kind of giving you guys perspective, you're talking to somebody who has two decades of firing guns. If you are anywhere under two decades and weren't a tier one or tier two operator, uh, then stop thinking pistol for your house. Because if you're shooting a 20 yard shot inside your house, you are not hitting your target. Don't believe me. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out to the range. I want you to take your pistol. I want you to get on the 20 yard line. Okay. Cold. Do not shoot your gun and warm up cold with your defensive ammo. And I want you to have somebody start screaming and yelling at you and put you on a timer and give you two seconds to shoot three shots. You're not hitting the target, bro. You're not hitting the target. And uh, you, the one that just said you were, you're really still not hitting that target. And before you do that, I actually want you to crank out 20 burpees. Do, then, do your 20 burpees. You're not going to hit them. Yeah, so, and then I want you to get up because you're going to be shaking and you're retired. And I want you to drop one round on an Ipsic. Yeah, you're not going to do it. So, but you are going to do it with a rifle. Yeah. At 25 yards, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You're going to hit somebody with a rifle because you can just point it. I, I guess my my house right now is like 10 feet across. Yeah, it doesn't. Count. <laughs> so so, yeah, no, I, mean, I can probably just throw something yeah, at somebody in my yeah, house. <laughs> yeah. But in my house, it's a long shot. All right, guys. So here we go. We're wrapping it up. Thanks for listening to the Last American Outlaw podcast. We appreciate you. Go look at our YouTube, The Last American Outlaw. Check out Instagram. Check out my TikTok. TikTok is actually pretty fun. All right, guys, Last American Outlaw, we appreciate you. Outlaw out.